secrets of our times are coded in the games we play. Video games say a lot about the period in which they were created. Video games are an expressive and representative art form. Video games are not just art, but they're culture, they're creativity. Two, one. A new industry was born from a wartime era on the brink of technological advancements. Isn't it nice that something like Cold War technology could, in its own adversarial way, spawn something that was adversarial in a really pleasurable way? Today, video games are an integral part of our culture, leading us into the future with eyes wide open. It's a very, very complex and powerful art form, and the best is yet to come. Ironically, all this began with a single push of a button. Presented by Best Buy, where this holiday, the wow's guaranteed. Video gaming represents the cutting edge of entertainment. A multi-billion dollar industry that has drawn millions of players into its digital domain. Video games are not just art, but they're culture, they're creativity. They represent, in many ways, a more complex structure than a good movie. I think video games are an expressive and representative art form. I think that they're going, they represent our beliefs, our attitudes, the kind of core questions we're struggling with at a particular point in time. And I think they will be rich in social documents. The challenge is how to read them. Because unlike a film, which the director makes a statement that's unifying, a video game is subject to change depending on the player's choice. First of all, CPUs are awesome now. Uh, they're really fast. Video card acceleration basically makes games really immersive. Screens are bigger now. You feel like you are like really there. Producing a video game today is like producing a movie. And action. It takes 100, 150 people. Costs 10 million bucks. Press stop. Wait, go back. From the beginning, video games have been a reflection of the times. What games do, like any form of entertainment, is they uh, actually are a way for us to kind of have a perspective on our existence, on human existence, just like books do, just like movies do, just like in its own way music does. In our world, staying connected is essential. Yet even beyond video games, pushing a button today is simply part of living in the 21st century. A mere 50 years ago, that simple act had a very different connotation. When people think about the, the, the idea of pushing the button, in the 50s that didn't mean pushing the button to play a video game, it meant pushing the button to end the world. One, zero. As the tension ratcheted up across the globe, computer systems were developed to simulate war games. No one can foresee precisely what course it will take, or what course or casualties will be incurred. The Cold War was a matter of pitting one simulation against another. The games are a technology about simulation. We use them to model real-world processes to predict results. And to some degree, that's exactly what was taking place in Washington and Moscow. It's like one global version of the game Battleship. The Cold War was nothing but a simulation to begin with. There is no war to study. There's only these possible future wars, these uh, fears of war, these probable outcomes. Unlike today's video games, there was nothing anyone could do to control the missiles in these terrifying scenarios. People like predictable worlds with predictable outcomes, or at least controllable outcomes, or at least the perception that if you got the skill, you could control it. That's very satisfying, because the world in general is pretty uncontrollable, and a little bit daunting sometimes. In 1958, a young nuclear physicist forever changed how the world viewed computers. William Willie Higginbotham, who had worked on the first atomic bomb, turned two rudimentary lines and a bouncing ball into the first interactive entertainment experience on a computer. Tennis for two. 
Every weekend they would have these contest to see who could come up with the coolest thing. Yeah, you know, Willie Higginbotham came up with this idea that you could take an oscilloscope and make a tennis game out of it. It was an expression of a kind of rebellious adolescent energy working alongside the military projects, taking this most expensive piece of equipment at the time and repurposing it to play games. Suddenly, computers had a use beyond military computations and would eventually reach a galaxy far, far away. Shortly after Laika's flight, the Russian man in space program began. The same centrifuge that tested Laika was now... Definitely Gagarin's flight w w was a very big deal in, in 61. Major Yuri Alexeyevich Gagarin was launched into orbit around the Earth. The Soviets had forged the way into outer space. But the U.S. was not far behind. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. The world now had a new obsession beyond war. A race for space. And video games were on the heels of this new passion. In the early 60s, programmers who had an interest in this territory were also making use of the first computers. It deeply influenced Steve Russell, an MIT programmer who first launched video games into that realm with his own virtual space war. Space race was in the, very much in the news. And, uh, you know, spaceships taking off, spaceships blowing up uh, were something that you could hardly escape. And further, I had just read Doc Smith's Lesman series. These are a bunch of science fiction stories where the, uh, the heroes went zooming across the galaxy, inventing new technology as they went, being pursued by the forces of pure evil. Before he could battle the forces of pure evil, Russell had to master the hulking PDP-1 campus computer. This is a PDP-1. The first computer I met, like, that, like a modern personal computer, you can turn it on with one switch. It was considered at the time a microcomputer, meaning it was only the size of a refrigerator. It cost $120,000, and it did something simple like typing or uh, being a desk calculator. The programs were typically called expensive, so there was expensive typewriter and expensive desk calculator. It didn't show anything spectacular. It was so unimpressive that they kind of felt like, like no way, we can do, with this PDP, we can do something way cooler. Eventually, we figured out that, well, you could have two spaceships and they could fire torpedoes at each other. Yeah, okay. Uh, that's kind of boring. Can you make something blow up? Yeah. If Tennis for Two was a lighthearted distraction from the war, Steve Slug Russell's game was a direct expression of the space race and the global fear of space war. That was straight out of the times. That was, you know, that was that feeling of the, the Soviet paranoia, you know, communism's going to kick our it was truly remarkable and ahead of its time, and it was profoundly influential on me. I think it was the world's most popular computer game for a couple of years, mostly because it was the only one. The coding instructions for the game were passed from programmer to programmer, and soon, any institution with a PDP-1 computer inevitably had a version of Space War also. It became open source, and we gave copies of the sources to anybody who looked and anyone who wanted them. These were young guys in their 20s who were part of a group that you, we think of today as the first generation of hackers. It wasn't so much rebellion as exploration. You know, there were all these new things to do and see. Sort of joy of a uh, bright, shiny new erector set with lots of different new parts. And you can build things. One of the things Steve Russell built was the foundation for what would become the most important part of any video game experience, the joystick. Originally, the controls were just from the console switches. And uh, then some of the Model Railroad Club guys built a control box using surplus telephone parts. Steve Russell was also the first programmer to put destruction on the screen. One thing that I sometimes say is, I unleash the curse of video games upon the world. Conflict brewing around the world in the 60s. Television was there to document the drums of war. But audiences searched for an escape from real life and found a new form of entertainment. The 
first video games evolved from the world's passions and fears. But the next generation of games would evolve beyond the world's problems. Zigzagging across the nation. Television was a constant source of bad news that one man and one idea would change forever. And all of a sudden, a video game turned into a hot medium. You now could control what was on that set. All thanks to a man named Ralph Baer. Widely considered to be the Thomas Edison of video gaming, Bayer created the first home console system, the Magnavox Odyssey. Before Bayer changed the face of television, he had lived the reality of war himself. Born in Germany, his family came to the U.S. in 1938 to escape the Nazi regime. A few years later, he was drafted by the U.S. Army and served in World War II. Bayer's wartime experience sparked his interest in television engineering. Afterwards, he went to work for a company called Sanders Associates. At the time, they made electronics for defense. And Ralph Baer was a young engineer working there who, whose background was in television technology. Baer was hired to design military technology, but soon turned his attention to video games and the development of the first home gaming console. He called it the Brown Box. The whole difference between what others did and what I did is that I had the vision that there are 40 million TV sets up there that can't do anything except tune in a local two or three channels. The Magnavox company has come up with an electronic game simulator that will transform the family TV set into a playground. I mean, you just couldn't believe it. I mean, this was, you know, at home? On your TV? Video games? This is like crazy world. This isn't the future. Build. We call the all-purpose box. Placing it on the all-purpose box contains a cassette. Twiddle it. Moves my paddle from left to right. The box played, uh, you know, seven different games. Allowed us to plug in a bunch of different accessories. And we produced a game that was fascinating, and it survived. Yeah, and you can still play today and still have fun with, with nothing but extremely crude symbology on the screen. You want to score, Bill? Sure. Let's, let's put, okay, one and nothing. We'll play a conservative game. They all got these switches. Here we go. Now I'm going to do a little English on you. Oops. Damn. Ralph Bayer had changed how the world viewed television forever. But like the pioneers before him, all the fun and games were funded by U.S. dollars. If you have a really serious and very techy job, you're looking for a little bit of fun in your job, you know? And that, that's how really video games were born. Somebody screwing around with an oscilloscope, figuring out how to do tennis for two. And with Ralph Baer especially, you know, working in such a serious field, I, I think sometimes he had to sit back and really enjoy all this technology that he got to work with instead of just using it for, you know, destruction. <laughs> Like any other technology industry today, it wouldn't exist if it weren't for the military because it was the military that was funding uh, research into computers during World War II for things like calculating ballistic missile tables and things like that. So the video game industry and the military have been like this from the beginning. Okay, I got you. Driver up, fire. After a time of great change, the video gaming industry was about to go in a whole new direction. In the late 60s and early 70s, the counterculture movement spawned a new breed of video game impresario, and Nolan Bushnell, founder of Atari, was at the forefront. It was the age of Aquarius. We're going to build a new world order, and it's going to be based on love and harmony and things like that. It was very, very much part of the early Atari ethic. Part of it was our youth. Part of it was the culture of the day to take risks. There was all this talk about we could be dead tomorrow. So there was sort of an attitude about living life of the fullest. Let's not postpone some of this stuff. So we were kind of of that culture, oh, let's give it a try. When people are arguing about who created the video game, there's, there's lots of arguments, but nobody questions who created the video game business, the video game industry. That is Nolan Bushnell. He was the first guy to say, 
hey, we can make money off this. No other company offers you as many different video game cartridges as Atari. Bushnell enlisted Al Alcorn to program the first arcade game. He gave me my first project, uh, which was to build a simple ping pong game with one ball moving a net score. And he told me that he had a contract from General Electric, but that he didn't really have a contract with GE. It's just spinning him. Well, I, I felt that he would need to think that it wasn't just a train. The spin paid off, and soon the Pong prototype that would change the commercial video game industry was ready. Gotten the game to where it played pretty well. Nolan said it had to have sound, and he said, I wanted to have, he says, I want to have the sound of a crowd approving. And somebody else said, I want to have hisses and boos if you lose. And I'm thinking, I, I have no way idea how to make this at all. I'm already way over my budget. I got too many chips in this thing as it is. So I simply poked around with a little audio amplifier in the circuit and found tones that sounded about right and wired them in. It was less than half a chip to put those sounds in. And I said, that's it, Nolan. He got it working in three days. I mean, which I was baffled by. I mean, he's so good. And then we changed one little thing. When the ball hit the different segments on the paddle, the angle went up, and all of a sudden it went from a ho-hum game to a knockout fun game. That little change was DC and daylight, night and day. When Atari unleashed Pong in 1972, the video game industry was born. Pong was the beginning of everything. I mean, um, Pong was the first game, video game, that people could play that was not inside of a lab somewhere. So I wrote the first instructions for Pong, which was step one, ins insert quarter. Step two, ball will serve automatically. Step three, avoid missing ball for a high score. And that was all it, that's all it took, so it was very easy to play. Any of us who was around for Pong remembers the first moment we played Pong the way people remember the Kennedy assassination, because we had the power of the pixel. Don't watch television tonight. Play it. I grew up in a pub in Liverpool in England. And um, my dad came in one day with a large piece of furniture, which a couple of guys hauled into the bar that was as big as this. Of course, it was Pong, uh, the predecessor to, to, to just about every game. The other odd thing about Pong was it was a two-player game, it required, required two people to play. You really couldn't play it by yourself. Pong played more on the, the rock, paper, scissors of competition. Now, it was another way for us to have a competition for me to kick your ass and prove that, you know, I'm the top dog. It was just at the beginning of women's liberation. Women and all the minorities, that all of us must stand up together and say, no more. The women of America are marching, more of them in the East than It was very acceptable for a woman, newly liberated, to uh, go into a bar and say, want to play Pong? I'll pay. Women have better small muscle coordination than men do. So women could play Pong in general better than men could. So this was the first time in many cases that on an equal playing field, women could whip any guy. In fact, women would come and, and, and hustle bars and, and make money. Well, I, th I think Pong comes out at a moment when America has gone through a very serious time in its history, not just Vietnam, the Civil Rights Movement, and so forth. There, the 70s seems so much more frivolous looking back on it than the 60s, which is a period of intensity. I don't think the video games created that sense of frivolity. They're simply symptomatic of a tendency of people to turn inward into their own homes, to be engaged in social activities, that everyone had gotten a little serious, a little hot under the collar, and so forth. So I think that's a better way to think about it. Even if everything was perfect in the world, there will always be a need for entertainment. At heart, play is basic to mammals uh, of all kinds. Puppies play, monkeys play, human beings play. We play across all national borders. We, we, and we play each other's games. Born out of Cold War anxiety and nurtured in the era of counterculture, video games would soon become their own weapon in a worldwide culture shift, starting with one great character.
In the U.S., the earliest video games were beginning to boom as Japan's own gaming industry emerged in the aftermath of World War II. Advancements in technology drove the country to rebuild. Technology rapidly emerged as key to Japan's success. There's enormous push for education to government for technology. Japanese youth are highly technologically literate during that period of time. Japan found its niche in electronics, figuring out what the, what the rest of the world was doing in electronics and making it better and mass producing and making it cheaper. If you look at Japanese culture after World War II, you definitely see the reflected experience of the atomic bomb in a lot of the work. Godzilla, king of the monsters, stalking the earth, crushing all the horrors. It's a period of time where Godzilla and the great rubber monster movies are coming out. So if you combine the cultural content of, the, of Godzilla with the technological power of the computer, you have something that looks like the fascination that's created by games. Japan was already at the height of the electronics industry. But in 1978, Tomohiro Nishikado put his country at the forefront of the video game industry as well, with an endless wave of space invaders. I initially thought of humans as the invaders, but the idea of humans shooting humans was criticized as inhumane. So I thought about what would be suitable and figured aliens invading instead. I figured there would not be any problems shooting monsters. I think when you look at space invaders, it's not a stretch to sort of, you know, look at the aliens in the sky and think about, you know, planes flying over Japan, you know, clearly uh, weapons of mass destruction being dropped from the sky. The thing that's interesting about space invaders is it was a very early uh, fantasy scenario. When you're playing it, you're going, we are actually being invaded, right? You know, I personally am being invaded by these guys. I am the frontline security for mankind. Space invaders had clearly unlocked something powerful in the Japanese psyche, and millions of teens were hooked. And it just took off in that way that really only in Japan do things take off in that way. You know, with video games, it was something new, it was something different. There was something to leave your house and experience. In Japan, that's particularly important because the homes are so much smaller. So uh, teens go out there in a way that is a bit different from the United States. We got a hint from the human heartbeat to create one of the sound effects in the game. The low tone of the ground rumbling when it was approaching. I guess we can create better sounds nowadays. But those days, when we only had limited techniques and devices, that was the best we could do. But we think we came close enough. You think about what Space Invaders did from a music and audio standpoint, it's really, it was four notes. It was, you know, dun, 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 dun. But what they did is they took the tempo, and as the invaders got closer and closer, they started to speed that up. As this music got quicker and quicker and quicker and it, and it started to make you panic a little as you're playing the game. To cash in on the craze, shop owners cleared out their merchandise and set up Space Invader arcades overnight. But not everyone welcomed the fad. Lots of moms refused to let their kids play games. It became a social issue since there were kids who had stolen money or made phony coins to play games at arcades. It was said to be a serious problem concerning child education. I think with Space Invaders, what, what happened was that technology for the first time created this big rift between the generations. And, you know, the, the older set who thought they were up with everything and they understood what was happening in the automobile industry and with television suddenly was left behind because they couldn't figure out why this silly game was so popular. All across the country, kids are being swept away by video games. They watch the dance. In America, you start to see all kind of ordinances passed where, you know, a certain number of teenagers couldn't be in a convenience store or an arcade at the same time. It really established an entire culture. Also, the thing about those games, it was a little bit uh, 
sad in a way was that they inevitably ended in the player's defeat. Uh, we didn't think about it, I think, consciously at the time, but I, I wonder if that doesn't reflect some of that Cold War paranoia that at the end of the day, war is uh, a defeatist game. You're going to always lose. But soon, a less pessimistic game would sweep Japan and the world by storm. Enter Pac-Man. this going wow it's you know it's so colorful <laughs> Pac-Man is uh, the perfect example of of Japanese uh, weirdness video game characters are really adorable though in the Western countries they will not be called adorable but childish it's a culture that has a different tolerance for cuteness than Western cultures have and we've seen that repeatedly throughout the second half of the 20th century to some degree it reflects the consumer power of Japanese girls Toru Iwatani was a young designer at the Japanese gaming company Namco before he created the first superstar in video game history. 26 years ago, 1980, was the year when Pac-Man was released. At the time when we were developing Pac-Man, arcade games had a wild atmosphere since they were only violent games like shooting games. And it was totally a guy's playground. But I wanted to pull in girls and couples into that place, so I targeted for a new game. We had gone through multiple topics from fashion to boys, but since girls always have dessert after a meal no matter what, we decided to pick the keyword eat. Then we were having lunch and I ordered a round pizza. I took one piece and there you go. There was Pac-Man right there. So we decided to go with that. The most important thing about, about Pac-Man or Pac-Man as we know it is um, that uh, it was the first game to introduce a protagonist, which was a huge jump in the history of narrative and video games. With that, it opened up a whole new world for, for developers and designers to get into and start creating characters that people could then associate with and identify with. It also changed things up a lot, whereas a lot of the earlier games were you know, based around uh, invaders and action and shooting, Pac-Man did something completely different. It was about eating. It's the best example of how something starts small with a game and just gets so huge that nobody knows how to stop it. Manufacturers would hardly make the games fast enough. Every bar and restaurant and coffee shop in America seemed to want one. It's the game most remembered, probably most beloved, that people get most nostalgic about. Uh, you'd be hard-pressed to find somebody in their 30s or even 40s, I guess, who doesn't have a story of having played Pac-Man. Everybody playing. Men, women, children, families. It seemed like Pac-Man had taken over our lives. Pac-Man is really kind of one of the, the beginning moments of merchandising, you know, where you take something that was designed for a game and it blows up into something completely different, such as music or stuffed animals or little squishy toys and, you know, cartoons and suddenly he's got legs and he's doing all sorts of stuff and then there's Ms. Pac-Man. Honey, don't you know? Pac-Man has been loved and accepted for so many years and sales never really have dropped. 25 years have passed, but Pac-Man is still here. It has had an amazingly long run. By the early 80s, it was clear that video games were here to stay, but the industry they spawned was about to take a roller coaster ride no one could have predicted. By the late 1970s, the popularity of video games wasn't just affecting the players. It was changing the creators' lives, too. Atari was, I think, the epitome of the 70s Silicon Valley company. I mean, we sort of defined that kind of a lifestyle of not wearing suit and ties and still doing serious business, making money, a less regimented approach. And we treated our people very well because we, we, we realized that our assets went home every night. We didn't care when they went to work. If they wanted to come in at noon and leave at midnight, that was okay. It was all about a true meritocracy. You want to be successful. The single most important thing that you have to be is a doer. But it was
was also an era of big money, and Bushnell was ready to cash in, selling the company to Warner Communications in 1976. The decision to sell it was as much out of fatigue as anything else. For a while, it was a honeymoon, but as things progressed, they became uncomfortable with our kind of crazy management style and our parties and all the fun we were having making money. But even with the new management, the Atari Brain Trust continued to move technology forward as they began work on their first home console system, the Atari VCS. What we had done with Pong was made a dedicated chip. That chip uh, would only play Pong. And to build another game, we had to build a whole new chip. And every time you build a chip, it took about nine months of engineering effort. So we had our research group up in Grass Valley create in three months the prototype for what became uh, the VCS. The VCS was renamed the Atari 2600, and after licensing Space Invaders from Taito in 1980, it flew to the top of every kid's Christmas wish list. With the Atari, it was really like bringing the arcades home. I got it for Christmas, and I sat down and played it so much that my dad's girlfriend had to come by and basically remind me that it's been two days later and I had to take a bath. Atari made up to $100 million off each of its titles, but the company's new corporate culture was slowly crushing the artistic foundation upon which it was built. It's really interesting. There became a lot of... Um anger between Atari management, especially after it was taken over by Warner and the programmers, because you get paid sixteen to twenty thousand dollars a year and you'd make the games all by yourself. And as these games became more and more profitable, there started to be a feeling among the game designers of why aren't we getting credit? We're afraid of empowering people. You know, I believe that people deserve their value in the marketplace. And so it was this real hierarchy that developed that we tried very hard to not have. At Atari before. Well, shortly thereafter, four of the guys left and formed a company called Activision and started selling their own cartridges, which were, which were pretty good. And that's, that became the end of the monopoly that Atari had. I just became unbearable to the Warner management because I, I started calling them dumb and, and this is really not a good thing to do to guys who were from New York and wear suits. And it... Uh, culminated in a board meeting in fall and I, you know, I quit, quote, was fired the following uh, January. <laughs> Certainly Bushnell's life is better because of it, at least financially, but he is locked out of the business he started. Riding the financial swell of the 80s, Atari believed the revenues would keep pouring in. Success for Atari came so easy to the people that were calling the shots that, that they didn't feel like they needed to be careful or they didn't need to be smart anymore. Atari lost it. The Atari video computer system. Once you turn creativity into just marketing muscle, uh, things get very dangerous because people get bored. The game that a lot of people talk about is there was a version of E.T. made in 1983 um, that was so bad that Al Alcorn, who programmed Pong, who worked for Atari, says that he literally cried when he saw it. The chairman of Warner cut a deal with Steven Spielberg where we paid him, I forget, a huge amount, 10 million or something. Uh, it was created for cheap, very quickly, you know, in no time just to get it out and, and rush to market. Kids flocked to stores and bought this title and quickly found that what they loved on the big screen was terrible on the small screen. Apparently, there were so many of these cartridges that we couldn't sell, we had to get rid of them somehow. And they wound up in a landfill, and the word got out, and then Atari then covered it over with cement to keep them out, and denying and said the cartridges were defective. Well, they were defective because we couldn't sell them. And so, yeah, it, was, it got pretty ugly towards the end. Sales of Atari video games dropped off sharply. Somehow, Atari products... 1983 was the year of the great crash. Um, in the late 70s, basically, when you talk to people who are making games at that point, they will say that making a game, you basically threw a game up in the air and you just waited for the money to fall down. So what you saw is that everybody tried to get in the market. You had so many competitors, you had dozens and dozens of companies. Public was deluged with games, and so many of them were so bad that it just turned the public off entirely to the medium. No matter how great the graphics sounds are, 
Still, there's something a little bit boring right now about shooting a Martian or something. The big crash. Not since 1929 has an industry fallen so far, so fast. The victim of oversaturation... In the end, the lack of quality games for the 2600 and the influx of games on home computers were too much. The gaming industry had matured into a legitimate business, but like any business, it was boom or bust. If you don't obsolete yourself, somebody else will. And then Atari did die a, a sudden and painful and loud death, but I knew it was... It was me in 1981, it just took till 1983 for it to catch up with them and, and happen. Stupid. I made more money shorting Warner stock because I saw it coming than I did on selling the company. No, no, that, that's a lie. But I did pretty well on not shorting their stock, not more than. But from the ashes came fresh opportunity. The door was wide open for anyone with a passion for video games and the know-how to program a good one. A new adventure had begun. By 1983, the American video gaming industry had crashed. But on the other side of the globe, in the USSR, Alexei Pajitnov held the pieces to one of the most addictive games in video game history. Tetris. The very early 80s were very dark years because it was absolute stagnation in politics. The moral climate were, were very dark. We didn't have any hope. We don't have too much entertainment. I mean, we have some movies, we have some theaters, but, but basically uh, the, the life wasn't settled for entertainment. In 1985, Alexei worked as a computer engineer at the Russian Academy of Science. I spent... 14 hours a day at, at, in my job, just, just playing with computer, like young hackers now. I realized that it's not what really interests me. My heart was in all this kind of small, small riddles, diversions, and puzzles. You know, he conceived of this idea, the kind of mathematically pure idea of taking all the different ways you can configure a set of blocks together and then having those not simply put together in a normal 2D puzzle, but have them fall in motion. I imagine the pieces uh, start falling down. You want to rotate them because that's very funny. Uh, shift it and, and put it back. So that was the main idea of Tetris. It was a different way for people to think in real time than other games. It used a part of people's brains that they aren't used to, to, to using in real time in video games. Um, it was such a, a, an awesome idea that you really didn't need graphics to sell that game. By 1986, PC versions of the game appeared beyond the Iron Curtain. But Alexei had signed a 10-year license agreement for his game. Taking a cue from Atari, the USSR sold the game around the world and made millions from Alexei's creation. Well, that happened with everything. So, so the people basically had no rights and whatever they produce or did, everything was, was taken from them. I didn't want to fight for my rights. Uh, I, I would rather have the game out, published. Play Tetris, <laughs> my friends. For all the Cold War posturing by the world's superpowers, Tetris was instantly welcomed into homes and offices across the globe. If you play it enough, um, like I did when it first came out, you start dreaming in Tetris. Tetris, I get Tetris vision. I look around the landscape and I go, oh, that would fit in there. You, know? you really rearrange the world. In the beauty of Tetris, it's not really culturally specific. And I think that's why it traveled all over the world, went on handheld devices, and it, it was the game equivalent of the song that you can't get out of your head. One side, I kind of a little bit compromise on this serious computer business, but from the other hand, I got so much fun <laughs> into this world that nobody could stand against it. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. In 1989, the Berlin Wall fell, and a few years later, 
So did the USSR. Extraordinary drama here in Moscow tonight. The Cold War conflict that had launched the video gaming industry was over. Alexei moved to the U.S. in 1991, and five years later, the rights to Tetris returned to him. Now I am just by my own, and uh, I do some, some small game design with my friends, and the rest of the time I just reading books and, <laughs> and enjoy myself. Tetris and the other games of this era forever changed our culture. There's something about those games that, is, that transcends history and transcends national borders because it brings us back to something fundamental about the human imagination, about human curiosity, about the pursuit of pleasure that's so basic to who we are as human beings. The technology changed dramatically, but human brains are still the same. So something which fascinates you 30 years ago is still interesting for you. The best old game will live forever. As the golden age of video games came to a close, another was already in motion. Led by a chubby little plumber who would take the industry to the next level. 